Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. The interview series, Reflections in Time, was begun by the late Professor Paul Borgie more than 20 years ago. This new series continues Paul's work and is dedicated to his memory. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960 and served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Professor Borgie in the development of his original interview series, and I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to continue this work. It's a uh, cold day in the middle of January, the year's 2005, and I have as my guest here today uh, Professor Tom Sires uh, from the uh, College of Engineering and Technology. Tom, welcome. It's nice to have you here with us. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. It's uh, to be here. You're in the Construction Systems Department, right, in the uh, College of Engineering? Systems. Right now, we're calling it Construction Systems Technology. Construction but, Systems Technology. But yeah. soon, I'm afraid it's going to be just straight construction engineering. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, uh, we're going to have to talk about that a little bit because... Uh, uh, a lot of people don't understand the relationship between the College of Engineering and the, and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the program we have here at the University of Nebraska-Omaha. And we'll get to that, because that's, uh, that's got to be cleared up sooner or later. But, uh, but let's talk a little bit about you first. All right. Um, you know, I've known you for a long time and uh, known some of your background, but uh, certainly our uh, listening audience doesn't, or for mm -hmm. the most part, anyhow. And so, uh, where'd you come from? Uh, what's uh, your background? I was born up in Wisconsin, but uh, we were from uh, Decorah, Iowa, right s south of Decorah, Iowa, a uh -huh. little town, Kelmer, C-A-L-M-A-R. And uh, Decorahs were uh, Luther Colleges up in Oh, yeah, Mary. that's well, where Paul Borgie, who we were just talking that's about, right. uh, went to he school. He was from there. Yes. Right. Yes, and I, I was there... Uh, I was born in uh, 1934, and uh, I was a uh, wartime child after a while, and I did hear Roosevelt's famous speech, and uh, my mother was a nurse, and uh, my father and mother were divorced, and so <coughs> it was pretty tough on my mother, and the Martin Bomber plant was opening up out here, and so she drugged me, and out we came, and my uncle, uh, who was working out here, was already here. And my aunt, uh, my Aunt Dolly, she was also a nurse. She came out, and so they started at the Martin Bomber plant. And I, they sent me to school at uh, St. Peter's on uh, 29th and Leavenworth Street. Mm -hmm. And I think I started there either the third or the fourth grade. And the year would be probably 42, I think, maybe 43. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got here. So, uh, and then you went to high school here, too? In the yes, I started, uh, I went to uh, Tech High, and, uh, but uh, during, uh, along the way, I was working for the Omaha World Herald. Mm -hmm. I was a paper boy. And uh, I went to Tech High and now we're into the Korean situation and all of my friends, a lot of them were dropping out and uh, going on and joining the Army or the Air Force, Marines, what have you. And uh, in my junior year, I did the same thing. I dropped out and uh, I went into the Air Force. Uh, I was very fortunate. The Air Force gave me a, a set of tests and uh, they sent me to a college 
uh, in uh, East St. Louis, Illinois, Parks College of Aeronautical Technology. Mm. And I was there for nine months and I was just about uh, 18 and I think I was the youngest full flight engineer in the Air Force. Mm. And I was stationed at Hill Air Force Base and uh, that would have been uh, 1951. And uh, from uh, Hill Air Force Base, uh, I managed to get myself clobbered out there in an aircraft accident. And uh, I was discharged out of the service, and I came back here, and A, I want to go to college, because I found out what the difference <laughs> was, what you had to do when I was down at Parks, and I knew I wanted to go t uh, to a university, but uh, they, I don't believe they would accept the GED at that time. So I started at Pratt School of Individual Instruction, and about a year and a <laughs> half later, I had my high school diploma under Mrs. Pratt, mm -hmm. and I started at this university, not this, you know, Omaha University, in September of 1956, and uh, I graduated with my first degree in, uh, which was engineering and business. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that degree, because that's an unusual one, isn't it? Well, it turns out it was a very good degree. You mm -hmm. would have a, a little bit of background in engineering. Uh, you got up through all right at the calculus level. Uh, the, at that time, the main things that they were pushing was analytical geometry mm -hmm. and applied trigonometry. And you did that type of thing. Uh, you did your surveying courses and some of your fundamentals of engineering. But you also took uh, business administration courses. And you also took accounting. I went up through Costa County. And we took that, uh, oh, that uh, exam that there was for if you wanted to go on. I know I did pretty well in mm -hmm. that and it took me three and a half years and I got that first degree and so I graduated in uh, January of 1960 from Omaha University and uh, my first job was with H.P. Fuller Company and uh, which is industrial epoxies mm -hmm. and I was all over the country I mean, I would be in Chicago, I would be in Omaha, I would be someplace else very quickly. And I did that for about a year, and I decided I didn't want to do that. And I ran into uh, Paul Kennedy, and Kennedy was in the uh, education department, and I told him, I just don't like it. And he says, why don't you become a high school teacher? I said, well, what would I have to do? He says, well... He says, you could still work, take some of these uh, courses, and we'll make you a high school teacher, high school math teacher, high school physics teacher. You got the background for that. And so uh, Paul got me in, and I, uh, oh, I did my, uh, I don't think I had to, I just took teaching courses, and mm -hmm. I had to become, a, I took practice teaching, and uh, I was out at uh, Westside, I remember that. And uh, I, uh, there was a junior high, and Lord, I can't remember which one I went to, but uh, the first place that I went to was uh, North High School, and uh, under Bert, Kenny Burkholder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who later was on the faculty. <laughs> yeah, who right. later was on the faculty. And I started there, I believe it was uh, January, it was in the middle of the year, January of 61. Uh, it could have been 62. I was 62, January 62, and about that time I brought home my first paycheck, and my wife, I think, believe this or not, I believe my pay was $4,600 a year, and I'd been pretty successful as selling glue <laughs> when I was uh, epoxies uh, working for H.B. Fuller Company. And I can remember my wife just cried. She says, we can't make it. We just can't make it. And by that time, I had two small children, and uh, Michael and Teresa. And so I, um, I was looking for another part-time job. Mm -hmm. 
and I ran in, ran into uh, Jim Hossack, who was one of my teachers. Another professor here, right? Right, and um, and he's still around. He's Lord, he's got to be up in his high 80s now. And I was talking to him, and he says, "Do you know anything about meteorology?" I said, "Yeah, we had some meteorology. I, I did that while I was in the service." And he gave me this book, and I looked over this book, and I said, "Yeah, I, yeah, this." not too bad and so I started teaching meteorology part-time probably in oh it was 62 I think mm -hmm. the beginning of 62 and um, about that time also uh, Jim was uh, he was well the first what I would call our real engineer that we had mm -hmm. And uh, we were under um, uh, we were under arts and sciences. No, I, I um, yes and no. I, I remember I was going to ask you about that because at that time there was no engineering college. No, no there it was, was a department. It was and, and I think it was they called it what they call a college of applied arts and sciences. Yeah, I think you're right. Which was separate yeah. from arts and sciences. Yeah, I, and you're in right. that college was engineering and journalism mm -hmm. and uh, and. Uh, Carl Helmstetter was Carl the dean. Helmstetter was the dean. Right. He was the dean. I believe his background was in uh, business. I believe he yeah, was. Yeah, I a, think so. I believe his, but he was a wonderful man. Yes. And uh, anyway, he brought in, he's the one that hired uh, uh, Jim Hossack. Mm -hmm. And ha Hossack came up with this idea about technology. We need guys that can go out and actually build that can actually run crews of men to build structures to build mm -hmm. to put roads down uh, this type of thing and he got to talking with a guy named Ed Kenny and Ed Kenny was a graduate from uh, Minnesota and at that time in Minnesota if you were a, a graduate of engineering it was a hundred and forty three hour degree that's what it was like when I uh, came through, we had one course, like say in surveying, mm -hmm. they would take three. Uh, I mean, whatever it had, they would probably just beat it to right. death until they really got it. And what made uh, Ed Kenny really unique, uh, he was a CB in World War II, mm -hmm. Saipan, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he laid those runways down, being shot at all the time. And uh, if you remember, uh, Jim Hossack also, uh, he was in the Battle of the Bulge, World War II, had the Silver Star. And uh, anyway... I never knew that. That's you didn't know that? Yeah. Oh. Anyway, uh, Helmstetter uh, listened to Jim quite a bit. And Jim said, we need a tech school. And so he hired Ed Kenny. And Ed Kenny started the Technical Institute and there were uh, I believe there were four departments that he originally started with there was uh, general engineering technology uh, there was uh, drafting and design there was electronics uh, and then there was construction did I say the four I think I said five right yeah. there and uh, that was the start of the technology and really the start of engineering because if you had technologists you had to have engineers and they ran hand in hand. Well about uh, in 1960 uh, Anston Marston joined the faculty here too. Colonel I, I Marston. Knew him very well. Yes Colonel yeah. Marston uh, he was from the army he was a full colonel in the the army he was quite a guy um, <laughs> Uh, he uh, he was I, in the Corps of Engineers here in Omaha. Yes, he was. He, uh, he was in the Corps of Engineers. Um, and at that same time, you had, uh, let's see, there would have been uh, Brown. Um, there would have been Vet Williams. Do you remember Vet oh, Williams? Oh, I remember Sylvester very well. <laughs> Sylvester, what made Sylvester Williams unique he was in World War One, right? And he used to show up in his uniform on, on uh, a Veterans, Veterans Day, Day every, and he every could year. always get in it. And he was a huge <laughs> man. He was really big, kind of a neat guy.
He uh, was an artillery officer. I yes, think. he was. He was an artillery officer. I wish he'd been interviewed in this series because he would have been a, a, a oh, good addition. A, we also later on too, we ended up having Jack Titus. Mm -hmm. Jack was the uh, captain of the submarine, the Norwal. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me that you were up at the submarine base uh, up on the east coast. Well, right now the Norwal, if you go there, the Norwal guns, his deck gun, is out there in the front of that. That's his gun off yeah. that one. I worked for the electric boat company for a few years and uh, was and lived there in Connecticut and worked with the people from the submarine base for a long time. Well, when I was having problems, uh, my wife, my first wife, uh, developed cancer, and Jack was my mainstay. He just, uh, he just, kind of really gave me a shoulder to cry on, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, I knew a lot of those World War II submarine captains, and they were, uh, they were the salt of the earth. I oh. mean, they had to be about the most relaxed people I've ever met, and uh, you know, able to handle anything that came up. And uh, I'll take have to it tell you, blinking an eye. A little quickie story. There's a book on Jack, and there's this. He was sneaking stuff in and out of the Philippines. And the Norwal was the largest sub that we had. Mm -hmm. And he, there was a reconnaissance airplane, but it had, uh, it could drop bombs. And so they spotted it and they moved back out and he know, knew how deep he had to go so nothing could hit him. And he told his, um, you know, his deck mate, he said, uh, wake me up when that guy goes away. <laughs> And I said, and now this guy was occasionally dropping a depth charge of some sort, some kind of uh, some yeah. kind of ordinance. And I said, Jack, now you tell me that you got a guy f around there. He can see you in the water, and he's trying to figure out how to get to you. And you went downstairs and went asleep. He said, Yeah, he couldn't have been there that long. <laughs> That's the way he was. He was a wonderful yeah. man. Now, uh, uh, we, so the uh, engineering college here was founded. Um, well, Colonel Marston was the first dean. I remember yes, that very Colonel well. Yes, Colonel Marston was the first dean. And he and I both came here in 1960. So in those days, we had a newcomers group, mm -hmm. and uh, we met together fairly frequently, and all got to know each other very well. I, Group included Kirk Naylor, incidentally, included Colonel Marston and mm -hmm. myself, and Ray Means in the library, and uh, oh yeah. So we all got to be uh, good friends, and uh, and saw a lot of each other at that uh, beginning. And I came in '63. Yeah, that's when they. Well, h how I was describing what had happened, uh, they hired me part time to teach meteorology, and then the technical institute got going, and. Uh, I got to talking to Ed Kenny, or uh, maybe he called me in, and he said, uh, "Would you like?" We had what we call tech math courses. Mm -hmm. He wanted some tech math, and it was just we had books that were called technical mathematics, mm -hmm. and they were made for technical people. And I said, "Yeah, I can teach that." And so they hired me on a full-time basis. And I started here, I believe it was in September of 1963. So I've been here 40 years. That makes you 43 years, and huh? Is that right? Um, yeah, I never stopped to figure. Well, I retired, you know, and uh, yeah, but you're still here. So yeah, I mean, that's yeah, true. okay. I haven't been teaching since uh, since uh, well, about almost five years now. Five years? Okay. Yeah. Well. Uh, 39 years, I think, was my uh, my total time. 39 actively. Uh, uh, this was my 40th year. Yeah, this yeah. is my 40th. But anyway, that that's. Well, let's how go back for a minute because I something you told me about was kind of interesting. When uh, you were talking about uh, Paul Kennedy, who later became dean of the College of Education. But, yes. Uh, back when uh, when he uh, gave you the advice that he did, uh, he must have been way ahead of his time because it's only fairly recently that uh, education colleges have taken people with degrees in uh, in the various educational and uh, technical disciplines and made teachers out of them. Uh, before that, you had to be enrolled from the beginning in the teacher's college. 
No, there was just But no. he did it for you. Oh, yeah. That there sounds, was, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, there was well, he was a, a really sharp guy, and still is. And, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and his wife, uh, Martha, is that right? Yeah. Martha? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. And then he would have, when you were a student teacher under uh, Paul, he would have those little parties, and you would go out to his house, and Martha, and it was, it was just, it was yeah, really yeah. neat. Yeah. yeah, I thought a lot of him when he, was, oh, he and he was, I were deans was, together. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah. He was a very wonderful man. Um, okay, well, you had you picked up another. Uh, speaking of education, you picked up another degree along with. Didn't you have a master's degree in physics? Uh, and about uh, when I got teaching with uh, for uh, Ed Kenny, and uh, he said, Tom, if uh, because I was having problems as the years start winding down my wife uh, had cancer and he told me if you know for stability what you really need first you need an engineering degree of some I mean a real one mine he did because it was both engineering and business he wanted a, a mechanical an electrical degree or civil mm -hmm. degree he wanted a straight degree and so I started working part-time on one of those degrees and he said, but to stay, you're going to need an upper level degree. Sooner or later, you're going to have to get your doctorate. And he said, uh, but you need a master's first. Well, the uh, NSF came along and National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. and a bunch of us started out on this program. And this thing was uh, most masters, as you know, are probably 30, 32 hours. I think this was 40, 45 hours. Mm -hmm and a bunch of guys tried it and they were combination degrees it would be like uh, math and physics mm -hmm. uh, math and chemistry math and whatever right. and uh, so of all the guys that started out not too many of them finished it and except uh, Charlie Sedlachik that's still over in engineering and my, who came out of physics and uh, myself we finished that particular degree and at the same time that I was working on that, I was also working on my civil engineering degree. So I'd have to look at the years now when I graduated in civil degree and when mm -hmm. I graduated with that combination math degree that I have, um, they weren't too, that many years apart. Mm -hmm. And um, actually because uh, my wife had been so sick for so many years, that kind of kept me sane, you know. Mm -hmm. sure. And of course, uh, and then when she passed away, I was, uh, uh, you know, a Mr. Mom, and there was a program that uh, this guy had three small children. Well, so did I. And uh, so there I was. And um, I kept going, and then uh, I met along the way there. I met my wife, and uh, she came over originally just to babysit. Okay, <laughs> and uh, well, the one thing led to another, and anyway, she's been here with me now for 30 years, and she and I have two children, and the um, fact is we still have one. We've got our last one in college right now, and my other one is student teaching, and uh, she's at uh, Morton, uh, student teaching out at Morton right now. But uh, you want to know something about engineering a little bit. Yeah, and let's, uh, that's probably a good time to turn to that because at uh, not too long after that, in 1968, we uh, became part of, uh, of the state university, state university system. Well, you know, first of all, uh, what we tried was that uh, they tried to get the city of Omaha to support it. Mm -hmm. and it would still have been Omaha University and uh, there was a mill levy and it got turned down. Now I'm not sure who actually did all the shaking of hands and everything and got the uh, state of Nebraska to start supporting uh, Omaha University but then we became under uh, the university system mm -hmm. and so we switched names and Omaha universities slowly ceased to be and it became the University of Nebraska 
at Omaha. And uh, when that happened, uh, there was, well, now you've got an engineering college in Omaha. Yeah, we, at that time, we did have a college. And right. Colonel Marston was the first dean. That's right. And we've got a college, a university college in Omaha, and you've got, uh, of engineering, and you've got one in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the fellows that were on this campus uh, in engineering, a lot of them, they had master's degrees but they didn't have PhDs. And Woody Varner, now you got to remember, at that time, the president and the chancellor's titles were, were reversed. Yeah. Okay, so uh, like it would be President Kirk Naylor on the Omaha campus, and it would be the total chancellor of the system right. and, he, and his office. And Woody Varner was, of course, the first of these uh, Chanc chancellors who yes. uh, actually was the CEO of the whole university system. That's correct. And I think what he was doing is uh, he went down and uh, he looked at the system and he said, well, on the Lincoln campus I have a lot of PhDs, a lot of researchers. And on the Omaha campus I have a, lot, a couple of PhDs, and we're looking at engineering now. And But m a lot of them would just masters. And so obviously I've got the better program on the Lincoln campus. And that just did not go over with Kurt Naylor at all. And there was no proof that just because you had a PhD that made you a better teacher. And Kirk said, I think what he was looking at, um, if I remember right, is the bootstrappers. Mm -hmm. And the bootstrappers, and we had uh, bootstrap program and these guys would go to school all over the world. These were military officers who uh, with an agreement between uh, Dr. Naylor and General LeMay, uh, Strategic Air Command, um, they worked out this program for military officers to get administrative leave for a year or so and if they could complete a degree program and uh, UNO, uh, at that time Omaha University originally, and the University of Maryland were the two universities in the country that had that program. And well, most of these fellows had college uh, some at some university. Well, they all did, yes. They had to. They had to be able to finish in a year or so. They mm -hmm. had to have enough. And I background. think uh, most of them told uh, Dr. Naylor that the education that they received here, regardless if it was an engineering, business administration, uh, whatever, it was as good or better than any they had seen. And Kurt Naylor ran with that. And probably he was correct. And so they got all of us one day and put us in one of these rooms in this old engineering building. And Woody Varner came in there and he said, well, I've made a decision. Uh, after about one year, the engineering on this campus is going to cease. There won't be any more uh, engineering. And he said the reason for it is that there's a lot better programs on the Lincoln campus than there are on the Omaha campus. And he went and he was given statistics. Mm -hmm. There was something like, uh, oh, it cost a student, I think, like, if I remember right, the university system had to pay out, like, on an engineering student, $500 per student on the Omaha campus versus 1200 or something on the Lincoln campus. Price makes it better, therefore it would have to be a better program on the Lincoln campus. And he was going through these statistics. And old Naylor looked at him and he said, baloney's baloney, no matter how you <laughs> slice it. <laughs> and, well... Well, in fairness, um, I think accreditation had something to do with it, too. We That's had a accredited program here. Yeah, but it uh, became more and more difficult to get a, a, a program accredited without Ph.D. faculty. Oh, uh, that is true. Yeah. That is true. That is true. And You'd so that, that had something to do with it. I'm... 
I wasn't privy to all of the things that were going on, but uh, that might have. But then later on, uh, just a few years ago, there was a big move to uh, bring back an engineering, separate engineering college here in Omaha. Were you involved in that too? Uh, at that time, I was the interim director of the School of Engineering Technology, and yeah, and uh, I'm afraid I opposed that. Well, and a lot of people uh, did. I had as a guest here Bing Chen, and uh, he filled me in on some of the details, filled our audience in. Too. I believe that Bing Chen was pro. Mm -hmm. He wanted to bring it back. And the problem that we had that most of us saw at that time, how are you going to finance it? Yeah. And we didn't have uh, Peter Kiewit right and the PKI building that we have now. Uh, but there wasn't any way that we could have financed the thing. And I think it would have gone, uh, if I remember right, it would have gone, uh, I was thinking in my mind, it would have gone for a short term and that would have been the end of it. And now you've killed the whole thing. Right. And uh, uh, I thought that the best deal to work out would be to see if we could work out a deal between us and Lincoln, which we have, and uh, get some more cooperation going. But at that same time, uh, they, uh, they put their hands out to some of us. And if you wanted to take that hand, and uh, like, for instance, myself, I went down to Lincoln. I was a senator from from this campus. And the faculty senate. I was a faculty senate, but down there I was by the Lincoln faculty. I was elected to the uh, executive committee. I met with uh, weekly with Martin Massengale, and I was privy. Dr. Massengale at the time was the president of the university. The he was CEO president. of the whole uh, the whole university. No, Martin Massengale at that time was the president of UNL. Oh, or okay. He was yes. the chancellor. And later became uh, yes. yes, Chancellor UNL. Later became president. Right. But at, when I worked for him, okay. or when I was working right. down on the yes. executive committee, he was the uh, uh, yeah, just the chancellor of UNL. And I get the president because of that switching all the time, which. Which one are we talking about? So here? you're neither fish nor fowl here. You're you're uh, <laughs> you're UNO or OU educated and uh, and a faculty member here, and now you're uh, all of a sudden a faculty member in uh, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, that uh, was easy. I all I had to do was look at my paycheck <laughs> and see who signed that paycheck, and the paycheck was being signed by Lincoln. And if I would have sided with some of the other guys, and you wouldn't have had an engineering here. It would have been gone. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but what you have now, you have uh, Peter Kiewit uh, came in. The major um, contributor con for the right. P uh, uh, Peter Kiewit Institute. And right now, uh, you no longer just have technology. And the uh, fact is, uh, you might be seeing the last of technology on the UNO campus. Uh, you're going to see is where we had construction engineering technology. It'll probably be just construction engineering. Where you had electronics engineering technology, it is uh, electronics engineering. And there is a, uh, a different accrediting group. It is way more difficult to get that accreditation. Uh, but ours are all accredited program. Mm -hmm. But let me go back something that you said originally. You were saying that uh, engineering wasn't accredited or it was harder to get accredited because of the number of PhDs. The engineering program that was on the Omaha campus, civil engineering, right. it was accredited. Yes, I understand that. Okay. Uh, uh, but what I was saying is in the future. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Was, like uh, I, th I think they were trying to look forward to it and saying, well, it's a breeze to get the UNL program accredited. It's going to be uh, an effort to, you know. To get the UN, uh, UNL University program accredited is no problem, but the UNO program might be a problem in the future. 
Mm -hmm. uh, possibly. Yeah. But uh, now I notice that uh, anybody that we go out and hire now, I don't care if it's for technology or if it's for regular engineering, if you don't have the PhD, they won't look at you. Yeah. It's a whole, I think uh, the only two that are left uh, that don't have PhDs and that have the full professor rank are Charles Sublogic and myself. Mm -hmm. That's it. And Charlie, I believe now, is not full time. Yeah. He's just part time. Yeah. But to become and to get a top rank, uh, and you know what you have to go through to get one of those, uh, you wouldn't even be considered. I don't care how good you were. You just wouldn't be considered unless you have a PhD. Well, how are things going now between the uh, currently between the uh, uh, between the faculties on each campus? Well, the faculties on each campus, like uh, uh, the department that I'm in, construction systems, uh, we are currently have a marriage going with construction management on the Lincoln campus and construction engineering technology on the Omaha campus. So there is trying to get the idea of having faculty, possibly even teaching on both campuses. And uh, the only problem that I think that you're going to see with that is the transportation, like today, you know, how do you get somebody here or something like that. But you can do this by, um, you know, via TV or something, sure. satellite, you could do that. I think in time, uh, I'm talking strictly engineering now, uh, that it really won't matter. But uh, maybe I'm being a little naive. Well, we're still pretty limited in terms of what our, um, uh, what programs are available here in Omaha. Uh, there's construction, civil engineering, essentially. Um, there is uh, now, uh, with IST, Information Science and Technology, a, a computer pro uh, uh, computer engineering uh, availability. But uh, the traditional mechanical, electrical. Um, well, you have uh, engineering electronics field. engineering. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the Omaha campus, you have civil engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I the, mentioned on civil. On the Omaha civil has always been here. Yes, uh, but the civil engineering is a two-campus. It has one chairman, mm -hmm. and he is both in Omaha, both in and in Lincoln, but it's just one chairman. Okay, uh, the um, when our when you marry the CST department in construction management and also in that marriage is architectural engineering, mm -hmm. all right, and that will become a school. So now you've got two campus, campuses involved in that. And if you came to me and you said, uh, I want to be a mechanical engineer, okay, you could start on the Omaha campus and you could take your next two years, take two years here, and you could take them two years down there. Mm -hmm. But say that you wanted to be an architectural engineer, all right? You could take two years on the Lincoln campus and then come down here. And that's what they're trying to get now. Is it all going to work? It's working, but it has little glitches, yeah. as you know. And uh, I think in time, uh, that uh, you'll see a lot of that go away. But uh, I could see in time that uh, if you could get transportation fast enough. Now, like, uh, I have a student that's on the main campus, and he's telling me that to get to my night class, he can't do it in 15 minutes, coming from this campus down to the PKI building. And he's going to be a couple of three minutes uh, late, and I have a nasty, it's a one night a week class, and I have a quiz every time you come in. And I say, we started off with that, and oh, he's pretty upset. So I said, okay, you know, if you come in a couple of minutes late, I'll, I'll give you a couple of little, you know, but you got to get here. And I think in time, possibly, that you might even, I don't know how fast the transportation will be, and you don't either, sure. but you could see where 
you know, what if we, what if you could do it in 20 minutes, 10 minutes? Would it matter? I don't think so. Well, let's. Uh, we've got a lot of territory to cover yet, so let's uh, let's move on to something else. One thing I wanted to talk about, because I'm sure you want to talk about it too, is this uh, program that you've been working with for so long now, with the uh, uh, with the student with the school students in, who are still in school, who might want to become engineers. You're talking about MESA? Yeah, I'm talking about MESA. The, the uh, Math Engineering Science Achievement. Right. Uh, let's see, I think this is my 18th, maybe my 19th year. Tell us a little bit about the program. Well, what we do essentially, uh, MESA is clear across the state of Nebraska. And I didn't start MESA. There are some very sharp business people in Omaha and they wanted mainly minority engineers. Mm -hmm. And the problem they were having, they'd go back east or someplace and get themselves a minority engineer. And boy, they bring them in in September, everything's fine. Come January 1, like what is it, five below out there this morning, they would take that about so long and they'd go back to, you know, Florida or wherever they came from. And so the powers of B, um, the businesses around Omaha, they wanted to have their own group of people that they knew that loved Nebraska, would stay in Nebraska, but they were engineers. And this was the idea of uh, Mesa. And so a couple of guys tried it, and what the idea was, you'd go out and pick out students at about the seventh, eighth grade level, and you would start uh, indoctrinating them, uh, giving them, making sure they had the correct mathematics and following them along. And as they got further and further along, and you would do this by, oh, taking them down to the different campuses, showing them what engineers did, uh, give them little, uh, little um, engineering programs like uh, we have the one that the one that you're probably talking about is the one that we do every summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were an eighth grader going into the ninth and you were picked out of one of the schools across the state of Nebraska, and we pick out about, oh, there would be on that level, eighth grade going into ninth, there would be about 50 students. And the first thing that you do, you build from scratch an AM, FM, welcome radio. But it's really kind of funny now. This Electrical engineers that we bring in, and we use students and some grad, they don't teach the, uh, any of the components. The stuff they do now is all done, you know, with computers. But soldering and all that kind of stuff, that's passe. So we have to train <laughs> our electrical engineers how to solder. And so we, about three weeks before the program starts, we've got this group that are going to be doing these radios. We have to actually physically train them. And anyway, we get that going, and they go in there, and they build from scratch an AM, FM, Walkman radio, and they do that for all oh, five days that they're doing this, mm -hmm. and that's in the mornings. And in the afternoons, they uh, go over to on the East Campus, and they're, they've got a bunch of old 4-H engines over there. The East Campus in Lincoln. And the East Campus in Lincoln, and they tear down and learn to tear down and rebuild those engines. And they're running when you get them. Now, the trick is you got to get them back together and get them running. And the ones that can do it the quickest, they get a prize. And it, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then... Uh, Does it work? Is it, uh, is it really uh, recruiting these students? Well, I've just got one now that he's going to go get his Ph.D. that we originally okay. had in 87, so something's going yeah. on, yeah. And uh, we've got uh, a, list of, uh, uh, a list of them. When we transferred campuses, our big history box went in the wrong dumpster. And so we're retracking, finding yeah. out where all our students, where they finally ended up, yes. And... Uh, everybody doesn't want to go to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln or Omaha, uh, especially if you're a minority student. Uh, they want to go down south someplace. Some of them do. A lot of them come back. 
But yeah, we have a lot of students that have gone on. And now the program now isn't just just minorities. It's people that are just financially in trouble. But the trick or the thing that you got to be, even if you're financially in trouble, your family is, you got to be bright. Are you bright? Can you handle it? And yeah, we've got a, a group of those. Uh, once you get through that program, and then we stay with you during the year and stuff, and uh, we're out at uh, the different schools. That's where I was this morning, and Morton mm -hmm. before I saw you. Uh, when you are, when you go through that, and what you're always talking about, what is engineering? What is, what could you do with this? Uh, what are the job opportunities? Okay, you do that kind of thing, and then what uh, we do. Uh, in the uh, all about the 11th grade, the 10th grade, we take you down there again, and uh, we run you through our uh, the what we call the institute program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing, if you are going to be a scientist or engineer, well, one of the first things you got to learn to do anymore is do a, a programmable graphical calculator. And the one that we use is the TI-86. Texas Instrument 86, mm -hmm. and there's a regular class on the Lincoln campus that they teach students to use this thing. Sure. We have the same book, only it's been cut way down. We use the same calculators. We use the same teachers, and we bring these kids in, and they start going through this program, and they get darn good at it. What we do is to hurry them along the, some of the best students from last semester, we bring them back and we make them mentors for this group this time. And these kids really get good at this. It really helps them with their mathematics. And we train them at night in the dorms in mathematics. At the same time, in the, uh, we do this in the afternoon there, and in the mornings we walk through the University and Lincoln. We bring them up here on the Omaha campus. We have a bus that comes up, show them what this one's all about. Um, you know, we've got several universities in Nebraska. I mean, there's Kearney, there's right. Omaha, there's Lincoln. You even have an extension out there in Scotts Bluff that's mm -hmm. pretty nice. We get kids from out at Scotts Bluff all the time. Uh, and what you learn to do is, how do you get into a university? What what does it take to finance an education? What things are available to you? And a lot of people just plain flat don't know. I've had uh, several parents on more than one occasion uh, tell me with tears in their eyes, this is the first member of the family that ever graduated from the eighth grade and now they're in high school and you're talking about going on to a university and now we have that happening and it's been happening and the Hispanic population uh, we have a lot of Hispanics especially in western Nebraska mm -hmm. the whole oh, population has changed yes. and those people have to be trained well, I wanted to be sure that we talked about this because I know that it has a reputation as being a strong program. Where, incidentally, where does the um, where does the support for this program come? The from? support main support comes from uh, businesses around mm -hmm. Omaha. Uh, a lot of uh, old uh, we Peter Kit Kiewit naturally HDR uh, supports it. Uh, there's a lot of them. The uh, Union Pacific Railroad. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of s support, but the engineering dean, he supports it. And every engineering dean that we've had, they support it. I'm right now, we're writing an NSF grant to see if we can get sure. some more money from NSF and see if that they will support it. And it could be a lot bigger than what it is, but again, it's always money. And uh, the, uh, oh, like uh, E-Week coming up, uh, February, some darn mm -hmm. thing. Uh, we're trying to get a couple of busloads of kids right out of Omaha right. that are going to come down uh, 
to over to PKI building. Show them what is engineering all about. I'll take out my uh, concrete cylinders. You've seen that lab I've sure. got and stuff, and we'll be showing them uh, what's the difference between a good concrete and a poor concrete, how you design this kind of, we won't show them how to yeah. design it, but we'll break them and they and how like you do all that, testing all that, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Great. And uh, we'll be pulling those students in, and the idea is to get students. You know, one thing I want to do before we finish up here, and times, as I told you it was going to happen before we started, uh, time's flying by, uh, but we still got uh, eight or ten minutes, and so... Okay. Uh, Let's. Uh, I, I want to be sure we talk about some more of the people that uh, have been important in the various programs that you've been associated with. We've already mentioned some. Uh, you mentioned a good many people in, in engineering. You mentioned, uh, well, well, why don't I turn it over to you and let you okay. uh, when you first, who do you think is important? When you first talked about this to me and come up with this idea, I was sitting down this week and I would come up with a name. Mm -hmm. And then I would kind of revolve around the names, and I made a list. Good. And uh, so I was starting with the list, and uh, the first one that I had on the top of the list, I don't know, can you read that name? It says Milo Bale. That's right, Milo Bale. And I knew Dr. Bale. I was Dr. Bale's paper boy. And I, when I was an undergraduate, how I supported myself is I carried papers. And uh, you want to hear a real quick funny sure. story? <laughs> Dr. Bale uh, saw me out going across campus one day, and he says, and I collected every 10 weeks, and it was $4.50, it was 45 cents a week. And he says, Mrs. Bale wants you to stop by, Tom, and, and collect for that paper. Uh, you left a note, and I'm sorry we missed you. We'd actually physically at that time would oh, go yeah. to the door, yeah, knock. I know. And My we, kids we did that, it. too. And I was a senior. I remember this. And I had a fairly high average. And I had taken a business course. And some way, my seat number and grade, it was a large course, my seat number and grade got interchanged. I didn't know what was wrong, but remember we used to get the little yellow slips? And I got a yellow slip. And I, whoa, and I went up and I talked to the prof, and uh, he said, nah, no mistake. He saw me that day talking to Dr. Bale and I'd gone just a little further on, <laughs> and he said, uh, do you know Dr. Bale? And I said, Uncle Milo? <laughs> <laughs> I was really kidding, but he said, uh, why don't you come up this afternoon and we'll take a look at those, and that's when <laughs> they found it. <laughs> but, that's, but anyway, you were asking about some of the names. Uh, we talked about Bet Williams, Sylvester Williams, uh, that was over in engineering. Right. Cheryl Pruitt was over yeah, in engineering. Yeah, he's the, one of the few people from engineering who's been interviewed in this series. Wonderful Paul did man. it years ago. Jim Brown, mechanical engineer that we had over yeah. there. And here I got Carl Helmstetter. He was We've the dean. We talked about him a little too. Applied Arts and Sciences. Right. And then uh, we had uh, John McMillan. He was in the physics. Yeah, right. he was the chair of the physics department. Uh, Bob Graham, uh, Ray Gunther, Jack Casher. Yeah, now the, all of those have been interviewed in this series in the physics department. Don Schultz, yeah. Robert Smith, right? Schmidt, okay. Uh, some of my favorite people that were some of my teachers, Dr. Payne, Wilfred Payne. Wilford Payne, he yeah. was a... Too many people have forgotten oh, Wilford. He yeah. was a... Uh, well, of course, it was a while back. It, yeah. He, Twin hearing aids. Do you remember right. that? Yeah. And uh, wonderful He was teacher. in the philosophy department. He started the humanities program. I took that five-hour humanities right. program. Didn't even know that kind of... S that's the problem with some engineers. We don't get that kind of stuff. Right. And you really need it. You want to... I think before you drop the bomb, you ought to know why you know, not just how to make it, but some of the humanities, some of that yeah. type of stuff that goes with that, they need to look at that. 
Uh, William H. Thompson. Bill Thompson, sure. Uh, when Thompson and, Blick and Vic Blackwell, I can remember this, the first day Vic Blackwell came on campus and they had that opening ceremony, mm -hmm. okay, and there was, he, there was the newest and the oldest faculty member. Uh, Thompson was the oldest, Vic uh, Blackwell was the newest, and he mm -hmm. later became a dean. He was in, uh, I think he was an art major, wasn't he art major? Uh, he, he was in the art, art department, graphic arts, and he was, uh, uh, and he was a painter, and he, uh, uh, but he was dean of the College of Arts and Sciences for a while because at that time uh, the art department was part of Arts and Sciences, then it became part of the College of Fine Arts, and uh, he moved out and I moved in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Wardle and yes. uh, uh, Warren Frankie. You know, all of those have been interviewed too. In this have stuff. they? I uh, keep mentioning that because uh, people should know that the tapes, VHS tapes of, this, uh, of these programs are available in a couple of places. They're available in the university library and they are available uh, in the alumni house of William H. Thompson Alumni House uh, in their library and uh, you can go in and look at them so if you uh, oh, any yeah. of our listeners want to see uh, any of these pa past interviews they're welcome to go and uh, and do that we only have 30 seconds left so oh. uh, let's uh, uh, squeeze one more in oh I'm just, you know Dr. Earl, Dr. Rice, Dr. Paul Hader, uh, Stanley Trickett um, those were all. Oh, I wish we had time so you could tell that story about the uh, <laughs> Trickett, <laughs> about uh, Dr. Trickett and uh, Kirk Naylor. Oh, that, that was funny story. Unfortunately, we're. Uh, I have to um, thank you for being here. We've had a, uh, a very pleasant uh, time, and uh, I want to thank our audience for joining us today in a visit with Professor Tom Sires, longtime member of the Construction Systems Technology Faculty at UN Omaha. We've been taking a look at some of the history of the university as seen through the eyes of the people who've made that history. This is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.